So um, our final speaker today, just before the panel, is Rod Chapman of Outran UK. He's a principal engineer there. Um, he's in the Intelligent Systems Enterprise Center of Outran UK, specializes in design, implementation, and verification of high integrity software. For many years, Rod led the programming language and software verification research group at Outran. Um, and I'm going to put a personal comment on your title as well, actually, Rod. Um, are we there yet? 20 years of formal verification in, in critical software. I remember actually working on a formal verification of software at um, Praxis, which is the former Outran, more than 20 years ago. So it's actually much, much longer than 20 years. Project, but um, that? that was the CDIS CD, CD, CD project, which I think was late. 80s, early 90s. Early 90s. Early 90s, working on Z specifications. It was VDM. So. <laughs> Am I on? Right. Okay. Thanks for coming, everyone. Mostly, thanks all for staying uh, this late in the day. I, I feel slightly like I'm the kind of final novelty speaker here today. It's like, okay, we better have a guy talking about software. Oh, okay. Get Rod. He talks about software. So having heard today all about how advanced and all these wonderful things you'll do with, with formal um, in hardware design and verification, I feel kind of faintly embarrassed that it's still seen as something that's a bit funny and unusual in software. And I, I often point out to software people and say, look, all these hardware people just do this. It's normal. It's, you know, it's normal business in hardware design now to do formal verification. Why is it still seen as being a weird thing in software? Well, this is a sort of reflection on that. And actually, some little niche areas in the world have been doing this for quite some time, particularly probably more than 20 years, probably going to 25 years now. So I'll talk about some of those. So um, to open then, what's our world? I work for this funny company. Uh, as Mike said, it used to be called Praxis. It's now called Altran. Our world looks like this. We build stuff like this. Um, the top left photo is the main operations room at the Nats um, Control Center in Swanwick. That's where all the aircraft, well, most of the aircraft in the UK, what they ambiguously call the London area control, uh, is actually everything south of Scotland. <laughs> um, the UK air traffic is divided into two areas called London and Scotland for some historical reason. Don't ask me why. So Swanwick deals with all the London stuff, and we have software running in that environment that helps the air traffic controllers. It's astonishing what they do in that room. Um, so that's the kind of world we live in. Railway systems, you can model railway signaling as a big state machine, basically. The points are a state machine, the signals are a state machine. The trains, well, the laws of physics apply, they accelerate and break and stuff. Um, the points, you know, move and things happen. And the, and the idea is to stop the trains bumping into each other. So that sounds like a problem you could might be able to model check or something. Well, that sounds interesting. Um, bottom left is the Typhoon aircraft, a pair of FGR-4s. Um, that aircraft is several million lines of code flying in close formation, they say. Without the software, the aircraft is useless. It cannot fly. Indeed, if the software fails in flight, it ceases to be an aircraft. It just falls out of the sky and actually falls to bits rather spectacularly. It's never happened, but the physics model says the wings come off about two seconds after flight control failure. Um, it's astonishingly, un it, it's aerodynamically unstable. The aircraft is like a kite without a tail, okay? It just falls to bits. Um, Rolls-Royce, we work with these guys on the big Trent series jet engines. We've got software strapped to the side of those engines. Um, the FADEC system built by Rolls-Royce for these engines is incredibly critical. It just has to work all the time. Work out how much fuel you put in the thing to make it go at the right speed. Um, and then we've got stuff like military systems as well. So that's our world, all this really high critical stuff. Um, you're probably thinking, well, what's that got to do with us? Um, all of you as hardware designers, surely you all ship software. You ship board support packages for your cores or your chips or whatever. You ship libraries to your customers of code um, that your customers want to reuse. And input. How formal is that stuff? What's the defect density in all that software you're shipping? How often do you have to update it and ship customers a new version and say, oh, sorry, there was a bug in the last version? It matters to your businesses that you get this stuff right, especially important stuff like crypto. <laughs> You know, so there's a lot of stuff in there that matters uh, at low levels in these devices. So an opening thought for you. Here's uh, Martin Thomas. Martin is the chap that founded the company that I worked for many, many, many years ago. Um, Martin observed this a few last year sometime. Every software project uses formal methods. Huh? Now, you're probably like these gentlemen. You're thinking, hey, what's this idiot talking about? We don't do formal methods in software. What's he talking about? Um, so we'll come back to that later. And, and see what Martin meant. So why bother in software in particular? Why bother with the idea of formalizing 
or formal verification. Um, our experience of doing this, yeah, going back 25 years to the CDIS project that Mike worked on and, and the air traffic stuff and everything else, um, some people seem to think that it's an exercise in masochism and the idea is to produce a, lots of paper, a big pile of paper printout with lots of funny squiggly symbols on it in order to show off what a great PhD you got um, and that uh, you're a master of squiggly symbols, that language is said. Um, and often we're criticised about this. People say, oh, but the language, this, these funny languages are so hard to read. Yeah, well, C++ is hard to read. So is VHDL. So is any sufficiently complex design notation that we use. Um, learning to read Z is nothing. Don't worry about it. Um, we started hiring physics people recently because the physics people look at Z and go, what is that? That is maths is easy. Because um, the theoretical physics people are used to dealing with a level of mathematical abstraction and complexity that just dwarfs what we do in computer science. This is just set theory and functions. If you can't understand that, you know, you can just come on, get over it. <laughs> so it's not, about, it's not about showing how clever you are by producing a big pile of squiggly symbols. I'll cross to this side of the room. Um, I'll cross the date line in the middle. Um, it's about this. It's about thinking. It's about asking hard questions about what it is that we're trying to build here and why. Um, and it's, to some extent, about tooling illustrated by a digital micrometer. So I want tools that are really precise but automated and run on a computer. So a digital micrometer would be what I really want, to be able to measure my software and go, oh, yeah, it's 2.66693 millimeters. Oh, that's a defect. I don't want to know it's about an inch. You know, um, metric units would be good. So it's the process of thinking about it that matters, um, not the resulting pile of paper. So thinking about it gives you stuff like this. It exposes ambiguity. You try and write something down as maths, and you go, oh, hang on, this could be too, this English language is terribly, you know, fruit flies like a banana, that kind of stuff. Um, English language, you try and write it down as maths, and you discover you can't. So you get stuck, and you think, oh, does it mean this, or does it mean that? Oh, that's important. Um, it exposes contradiction. Very commonly, you look at your source material for software projects, and one document says it shall be green, and another document says all oh, this thing shall be blue. And you go, well, you, you can join those two predicates, and you get false. Um, you know, tell me if I'm getting too formal for you. Um, so contradiction is important to find. There's a really big one is incompleteness. You just discover, we've heard a lot today about corner cases. Software is endemically full of corner cases. I mean, a lot of software engineering is about just getting all the corner cases. And incompleteness is terrible. Most of the problems we're seeing with security in software, you know, so-called vulnerabilities in software, is just because you didn't bother to think about, oh, what if the data's invalid? What if the user's malicious? What if the system isn't in the right state to do this operation? What if this precondition isn't true? Um, incompleteness is, is it's just endemic in the kind of stuff we do. Um, and it's really nice if we have tools that spot that kind of stuff, that will say, oh, you've missed a case. What are you going to do about this? Um, and a lot of that's to do with error handling. Um, in our formal specs of big systems, about 70% of the formal spec is error handling. It's specifying what happens when something's wrong. The bit at the end that says, if everything's okay, the system does this, that's actually quite small. <laughs> okay? It's all the error handling is, is dominant. Um, what happens with customers a lot? Um, is you find one of these, these ambiguity things. Well, what you shouldn't do is guess what it means and just crack on, right? Because that's not a good idea. What you do is you pick the phone up, you call the customer and say, hi, how's it, Mr. Customer? I found this problem. Look, this and this and this can't be right. Look, I'm stuck. What should I do? The customer always says the same thing. They don't tell you the answer to the problem. They say, God, no one's thought of that before. That's the light bulb moment for the customer. They go, oh, we never thought of that. Oh, God, yeah. They go off and have a think, and they call you back an hour later or something. And they go, OK, we've decided it should be this. And you say, right, we'll write that down formally, and we'll agree that that's what it's supposed to do. Now, some people say, is this hard? Because you end up calling the customer a lot, right? In the first few months of a project like this, you're on the phone to the customer six times a day, and the customer's getting really bored of hearing your voice. And people say, well, isn't this painful and annoying? Well, kind of. But is it more painful and annoying than just ignoring this issue and then in six months or a year's time you've taped out fab silicon shipped a million units and you discover you did the wrong thing? What's that going to cost you in terms of pain or liability or going to court or goodness knows what? So it's painful but worth it. It's a bit like jazz, you know, it's kind of hard but worth it in the long run as one of my colleagues used to say. Um, the catch. What's the catch? So, so if this formal stuff's so great in software, what's stopping us? Why can't we just get this right? Well, there is this weird fear of mathematics in software. 
we're trading graduates to, to hack and test, and they, they don't stop and think formally, which is a shame. There's a lot of snake oil in the industry. Over the last 20 years, you'll see a lot of tools. We'll say, well, our tool will find more of the bugs. You know, and there's an awful lot of snake oil. Um, in a market for snake oil, it's perfectly rational to reject it all and just walk away and say, this is all crap. Why won't you buy any of it? Um, oversold promises in the 1980s. Those with very long memories will remember a project called Viper, which was an effort to formally design and verify a microprocessor in the UK. They even did a formal compiler. Did you know there was a formally verified Pascal compiler built in the late 1980s by a team at, at, in Cambridge, which pr significantly predates CompCert, but don't tell the French. Um, so over so something else is wrong. There, there's various things. Um, Les Hatton from um, Kingston said this, software is a fashion industry with delusions of grandeur, which I liked. There is a lot of problem in software with people tend to, to, to mistakenly associate popularity with fitness for purpose. So you look at the, the, you know, the most popular programming languages and you say, well, we must use one of them because they're popular. Yes, you know, we must use Python or whatever, or something cool and sexy. Um, fitness of purpose is not the same as popularity. And it's quite reasonable that in certain areas, niche technologies exist, um, which are not popular in terms of dominating the world of programming, but are actually really good at what they do. Um, and that's fine. The big problem, a lot of the notations we deal with, unfortunately, mostly programming languages, but other things as well, um, are really rather ambiguous and unsuitable for this task. Um, so to pick on programming languages in particular, firstly, they're not formal, um, and they're, they're certainly not unambiguous. If you read the standard definition of C or C++ or ADA or most of these languages, they are riddled with these things called undefined behaviors or unspecified behaviors or erroneous behaviors, where the standard just says, hey, we don't say what happens here. All bets are off. You know, anything goes. The compiler can do whatever it likes. From the point of view of formal verification, that's disastrous because you're, you're, you're into a, a kind of semantic black hole that's unrecoverable. Um, they're very poorly defined. They're mostly defined in English, which doesn't help. Um, and they contain, languages contain hard to avoid features which are really hostile. When you try and build a formal verification tool for software, you'll find it's really hard because of stuff like ooh, pointers. Um, if I came to you and said, OK, we're going to program in C, but we're not going to use pointers, again, you'll think I've gone mad. Um, so that's kind of hard to get rid of. This undefined stuff is an absolute killer issue for us. It, it is the black hole of disaster for, for, for language verification. Um, concurrency is the elephant in the room of programming language design. Very few languages get concurrency into any kind of discipline shape where you can reason about stuff happening in, in programming language stuff. Um, I mean, in, in terms of concurrency, Java put the, the world back about 20 years. If only they'd read the design of concurrent Pascal and the guy called Pear Brinch Hansen's work, they might have done a bit better. Um, but it's taken decades to sort this out and come back to something sensible. So who knows C? Stick your hands up. Come on. Don't be shy. Who, who is at least reasonably familiar with a programming language called C or C++? There's a lot of shyness breaking out in the room now. People not willing to put their hand up because they know this is going to be a, a, a bear trap of a question. How many of you are really fluent with C? How many would say you're real experts, language lawyers? Anyone? Oh, come on. Um, so if you've got something like this, you've got an integer i, an array of integers called a, and you initialize a properly, and you initialize a properly, um, and then you encounter a line of code like that. What does that mean? What does that mean? Anyone willing to give me a semantics? What does it mean? Almost perfectly a correct answer. Very unusual that somebody gets this right. <laughs> and what's interesting is I did this at Embedded Systems Conference, and the room just degenerated into an argument. I had about 300 people in the room. You get about one third of the people saying, oh, it means this. One third of the people saying, oh, no, you're, rubbish, you're, you're crap. It doesn't mean that. It means something else. About a third of the people say, don't know, and are willing to say they just don't know. Um, and very rarely, someone will put their hand up and say, actually, formally, this is an undefined behavior because there are two side effects to the same variable with only what's called a single sequence point. Okay, in the C standard, they're called sequence points, which is something to do with the positioning of that semicolon on the end there. Um, undefined behavior, which means for a compiler, it's really easy. You just do anything you like and spit some code out and carry on regardless. And you don't even have to issue a warning or anything. You just generate anything you like and then propagate the undefinedness around the program and do crazy stuff. So for compilers, this is easy. For a verification tool, like for a static analysis tool, this is disastrous because suddenly you don't know what the program means. And it's not just that one line of code, you don't know what it means. The whole program becomes undefined at that point. All bets are gone. Um, so for, tool, for verification tools, this is disastrous. 
Um, you can guess what it means. That means your tool is unsound. Basically, you can say, yeah, everything's fine, no bugs, and you've got a bug. So that's unsound. You get a false negative, which is bad. Um, or you, you stick out a warning saying, warning, program might be wrong, and you just get a zillion false alarms. Because guess what, folks? Undefined behaviors are endemic in most programming languages. In C and C++, integer increment, integer addition is undefined on overflow, or signed, <laughs> watch it, signed integer addition or signed integer increment is undefined on overflow. Try writing C code without ever adding up integers. You're probably not going to get very far. So this is a really disastrous issue. Um, so some examples then of some successes. I've told you why it's hard. Let's look at some successes. Are there any actually actual properly formal programming languages in use today where formal means unambiguous, mathematically defined, and amenable to sound verification. So verification where you can really trust the results. Can anyone give me an example of a, a formal programming language? So Sorry? We'll come on to specification languages. So B, for example. Yeah, event B. Event B would be a good, a good, a good example, yeah. Um, Pascal. Pascal. Haskell, yep. Uh, many of the functional languages do, do have this property. So we would start with possibly the functional, the higher order languages, particularly OCaml is often noted as being formal. OCaml is used to actually to build a lot of tools. You'll find stuff like the French Y3 tools are all built using OCaml. Um, scheme as the kind of sane subset of Lisp is often cited as being formal. In the imperative programming languages, the two that are most obvious to me are this thing called Spark, which is the one that I've worked on with the team in Bath. That's a subset of Ada which is formalizable. Um, Eiffel, the language that brought us the idea of contracts. Well, Eiffel ben benefits from being formal because there's really only one implementation of it that's worth knowing about. It, it, it's you know, Eiffel software's implementation. So you could argue that Eiffel is software. At a lower level, there have been lots of efforts to formalize JV JVM bytecode very successfully. And at lower down than that, we've already seen today, you'd hope that most instruction sets are reasonably formal. So today we've heard about the ARM, you know, the book of ARM. Yeah. Um, is with undefined and implementation defined. Is it? Yeah. Dang. I obviously haven't read all 6,000 pages of it, excuse me. Um, that, that's, oh, that's disappointing. Um, I made this point at Intel once in, in Portland, Oregon, and all the Intel people kind of went and then rumbled and giggled at each other. But anyway, at one level of abstraction, I would like to think that machine code is reasonably formal. Uh, okay, uh, well, oh well, maybe I'll go back to, thank God, I'll go back to programming in high-level languages. Um, if we include so-called specification or modeling languages, there's one that's very obvious is the language that underpins a tool set called SCADE, uh, which is called Lustra, which is a synchronous data flow language that's very, very well respected as, in its formality. B and event B, CSP for modeling concurrent systems and model checking. Um, there are several attempts to formalize subsets of MATLAB Simulink. Um, those those efforts tend to get really far, and then MathWorks come along and change the semantics with the next release of MATLAB, which is really annoying, and you have to start again. But there are several formalizations of, of, of MATLAB and Simulink. Um, there's a language called Perfect from Escher Technologies, which is, again, the specification and refinement language, and so on and so on. So there's actually quite a few of them out there. Um, here are some examples of stuff that's actually really honestly using formal verification in software. First one I've mentioned already is that there is an awful lot of software formal software verification in that aircraft that started in 1990, so 27 years ago. They started doing things like verification, there's no data flow errors in this software, was routinely done from 1990 onwards um, in all the risk class one systems. More recently, they started doing things like using theorem provers to prove type safety, so to prove that there's no buffer overflows or integer overflows or division by zero in the software. On systems like the fuel management computer, um, they've been doing theorem proving on this software more recently. That's a C27J, um, small um, transport plane. That's a baby one of those. That's a C130J. That was built about 20 years ago. Significant formal um, verification of that, that the mission computer um, actually implements the, um, the specification. Its specification is written in something called Parnas tables, which is a sort of semi-formal tabular format for, for specifying software. That was done at Lockheed Martin um, and by BA Systems. That's a system called Sholis, not the helicopter. There's a system that helps you do things with the helicopter. That was done in about 1995. Um, first, probably first really big deployment of theorem proving on that software.
software. It's only about 20,000 lines of code, though. Um, a first effort to really do serious proof. It was pretty painful 20 years ago. We just didn't have the CPU, the, the machine resources to us. And the, and the, the theorem proof, SMT hadn't come along. <laughs> that SAT solving hadn't gone full <laughs> at the time. So it was hard. Rolls-Royce, um, that's a BR715 or something, jet engine. Um, that's a Trent series jet engine. There's a lot of thermal work in there. Mondex, electronic money, some of you may remember. There was substantial formal methods work done on the, the Mondex cash system. That's a box built by Rockwell Collins in the States. That's a, um, a multi-security level switch. So it routes top secret data down one network and it routes stuff that isn't top secret down another network with a high degree of assurance. Um, something called Tokeneer we did for the NSA. That was a demonstrator. We did that about 10 years ago. That's a box that Neil, where's Neil? Neil will tell you about. That's something called the, the UK-Norway Initiative Information Barrier. Um, that's open source. If you want to build one of those, you can, because you can download all the schematics and the software and build your own. Should you want to detect ratios of isotopes of exotic materials, um, why would you want to do that? Go look at the the, the UK Norway initiative. is an astonishing thing. Go and have a look at it. Um, that's the air traffic control system we built for Nats most recently. This is live. If you've flown in or out of the UK in the last five years, you've depended on this. Um, what it basically does is it tells air traffic controllers um, that stuff's going to happen in the future. So the bottom right icon you can see on this screen, basically on the x-axis, it says that in about 12 minutes, Virgin 4.4 and British Midland blah blah are going to be on the y-axis about four nautical miles apart. And that's too close. So that's telling the air traffic controller that in 12 minutes there would be a loss of separation. Therefore, the controller needs to do something something about it and they can plan ahead um, in terms of telling the aircraft what to do to climb, descend or turn or whatever. Um, it's a, there's a, it doesn't look like much, right, but there's a quarter of a million lines of code behind there. So in terms of scale, this is now you know, an order of magnitude above where we were 10, 15 years ago. In terms of number of proofs, this generates about 150,000 proofs um, from the, for the theorem prover. In terms of performance now, with distributed caching of proofs, we use memcached to just remember all the proofs we've ever done. Right? With distributed proof caching, we can reprove the quarter of a million lines of code in about 15 minutes now. So we're down to coffee break for the whole system. For one module, it's a matter of seconds. So that's now a, that's now a pre commit activity. Our developers do not commit code to the CM system unless the theorem prover says, yes, it's type safe. Okay, type safe being a posh programming language word, meaning it never crashes or does anything stupid. So we take out all the undefined behavior, buffer overflows, division by zero, range violations, all of that stuff is blown away by the theorem prover. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. There are some encouraging signs. Um, formal methods, you know they're working when you don't know you're using them. When they disappear behind a really good tool, like the SCADE system, for example, you don't really know there's a formal language under there. Um, so stuff like compiler optimization, you just take that for granted, right? But that's heavyweight formal methods. You just don't have to worry about it. It's automated. Um, the kind of basic code analysis and verification that you can do now um, should just be part of your development, sort of normal everyday activities these days. Lots and lots of tools. Lots of tools on the market suffer from soundness issues because your C code is ambiguous. Guess what? They just guess the semantics and go, yeah, it's probably right. There's some results, okay? So there's lots of soundness issues but you should be doing that stuff. And stuff like BMC, constraint solving, we're using BMC for test data generation now, that's very cool and just automatic and brilliant. Using bounded model checking to just find the low hanging bugs in systems is really good, especially if you get a test vector. So it says there's a bug and here's the input data. That's very cool because it, it provides what we call the head slap moment. The head slap moment is when the counter example pops out the tool and you go, oh God, yeah, like that. For those of you that are online, you didn't see that, okay? Um, I'll leave you to work it out. Um, security is a big deal. Um, the problem of the fact that now we have lots of network systems and we have malicious organizations and people out there, this changes the world. Programming Murphy's computer is reasonably hard. Programming Satan's computer is brutally hard. Um, finally, you know, people are realizing that saying, oh, we've tested it lots is just never going to be good enough. You will never test all the corner cases because the state space and the input data spaces are so huge in software. You're never going to test all of it. It's just impossible. Anyone that says, oh, we've tested it to death. No. Even a really well-organized penetration test effort 
will miss bits. Tough. I mean, you will keep penetration testing until you run out of money. You know, you'll, you'll, when do you stop penetration testing? It's when you have to ship the product or when you run out of money. Those are the two, and that's not complete in either sense of the word. Um, so people now for security are realizing that this, this idea of soundness in formal verification is really important because with sound tools, we really can make a claim that we've got all the bugs. You know, we've got every undefined behavior, every buffer overflow. That's what we do with the technology like Spark, which is, is you know, a very different kind of approach. Um, I always set homework in these talks. If you went back from this conference, went back to your desk job tomorrow and did nothing different, this event will be, um, you know, a waste of time. You need to do something as a result of having come along today. So first thing I usually recommend is this. Um, you need to check this guy out. Um, does anyone recognize this gentleman? Anyone online recognize this gentleman? No? This is a guy called Atul Gawande, Dr. or Professor Atul Gawande. He works, he's a surgeon in Boston, and he worked with the World Health Organization on how to improve the safety of, of hospital surgical procedure. Um, and he ended up writing a book. Has anyone read this book? Please say yes. Great, you all need to read this book. This is a book, the subtitle is telling, the subtitle is How to Get Things Right. Um, how do surgeons get it right? How do surgeons not screw up and kill people? You know, I mean, on the operating table. How do, what, does this, what disciplines? Well, they have about a 12-year training period for a start. That's important. But how do they actually get it right on the day in surgery? Um, well, they use some crazy simple things like checklists. Um, read this book and then translate what you've learned into the world of software engineering or hardware engineering. And stuff like reviewing your own stuff with a checklist comes out to be really, really important. Um, so this book is sensational. It will persuade you never to go into hospital, though. Um, it will persuade you to avoid, avoid operating theatres. Like. Um, the other bit of homework, if you want to try out one of these lightweight, easy adoption kind of formal analysis tools, I would commend to you something called Facebook Infer, fbinfer.com. This is Facebook's tool. Facebook bought a company that spun out of Queen Mary called Monoidix, um, Dino Di Stefano and co. They all got solid up by Facebook, and they've built this amazing facility that's built into Facebook's development infrastructure now called Infer. It's very good at finding pointer-related bugs. Um, and that's a good thing, because there's lots of them. <laughs> you know, it's a rich target area. In languages like C, C++, Java, and Objective-C, um, there's lots of pointery related things you, you, know, you, you, can, you can trip over. So this, this tool is very good at finding. So, and it's open source. It's free to get hold of it. Give it a go. Go sit, stick it, you know, chuck it, chuck your code base at it, and see what happens. Um, there are lots of other tools out there on the market you could try, and go and learn about them. Okay, so the closing thought will be come back to Martin. Martin said every software project uses formal methods, and we thought, oh, what's he talking about? Well, here's a formal language. Ah, oh, well, maybe it isn't. Someone will disagree in the front row. Formal language that you all use. In fact, it's in your pocket right now. Is that? I believe that's ARM assembly code or ARM instructions. Now, is that reasonably formal? It's a language that's churning away in your pocket on all your phones. Um, I don't know how many ARM CPUs are in this room. It's probably 100 or something. Uh, there's a lot of them about. Um, so machine code, if we can see machine code is formal, well, the issue then becomes not if you're going to use formal methods, but when you're going to start using formal methods on a project. And for most software projects, the current situation is far too late. <laughs> Um, that's the problem. We need to persuade people to do this sooner um, with source code or specifications and, and moving up the chain. Um, a lot of this work is actually written up in a paper that we presented a few years ago at a conference um, in a, a conference called Interactive Theorem Proving. If you contact me, I can send you a PDF of the paper with my contact details. Um, at that point, I will stop and say, thank you all for listening. Are there any questions with the spooky looking cat gif? <laughs> that will stare at you. Thanks, Hi, um, I'm Tarek, I'm, I work at Huawei, and what I'd like to say is your example earlier, where it wasn't obvious what the value of i was because yes. of the increment, that maps directly onto an ARM instruction where you don't know what the result is. Really? Yes. There is such an instruction? There is such an instruction. It's called oh, good a load. <laughs> it's called what? It's called a load, but if you... If the address register is the same as the target register and you increment the address register, oh, okay. you don't know which one you'll get will get the update. Is it is it the situation where there's a small set of possible outcomes and you don't know, or is it an infinitely large set of possible no, outcomes? No, you, you, you either 
you either don't execute the instruction, you take the okay. address increment, or you take the load value. So it's okay. constrained to one of three things. Okay. So that's the equivalent of what we call unspecified in programming languages. Unspecified behaviors, there's, a, there's an innumerable set of behaviors that you can say, well, it must be that, that, or that. Yeah. Undefined is infinitely large set of, you know, anything goes, which is much worse, as you can imagine. Okay. So, all right, thanks constrained, for the point. unpredictable, they call it. Okay. Ashish Sarvari, one spin solutions. So um, is it right to say that um, a lot of the examples you cited on software verification use theorem proving uh, to a large extent? Yeah. And it's somewhat ironical that in the hardware field, the model checkers have found a lot of success and continue to be used much more than theorem provers. Do you think any specific reason why? Is it because we don't have good model checking tools uh, for software or? It's just because it's I, considered to be so critical. And then the other related question is, what do you do when you encounter um, the scenario where you cannot prove lemmas or all other things? How do you go about discovering what is missing in your problem statement, as it were? OK, so, yeah, that's a good point. So yes, most of the examples I showed you are projects that I've worked on, I know about, and yeah, they are using predominantly kind of classical theorem improving style approaches. Um, I must admit, you know, more recently we're using the more modern um, SMT based provers which combine all these things in, in amazing, wonderful ways. They combine SAT and um, SMT and, and various decision procedures of different theories all in some magical way. So we use Z3 and CVC4 and Altergo um, in the modern tool set. Um, we are using bounded model checking as a way of either quickly generating test data or quickly finding um, bugs it, and it, it's automated because it just does loop unrolling okay and that's not sound because you know if you, if you unroll the loop eight times but there's a bug on the ninth iteration you're not going to find it right but if there's a bug in the first eight iterations bang it finds it really quickly and gives you the testing so bounded model checking is there's a tool called C Prover from Oxford we're adapting C Prover to work with Spark now with Daniel Kerning's team at Oxford um, that's proving that gets you a lot of bang for the buck because it just gets it, it quick gives you dumb mistakes and you go oh, head slap yeah that can't be right fix it so it stops you trying to do hard symbolic proofs on stuff that's wrong which is a waste of time so we're, we're seeing more of a kitchen sink approach now where we we chuck in the best things we've got and it's not just classical theorem proving there's, there's yeah sat and, and bmc as well anything else we can do what was the second one was it was there a second that's question, question. what well, that was the second question okay Okay. Um, often, if you do try to do a proof, um, a fully symbolic proof, um, you'll find, yeah, there's a missing lemma, and you can't prove it, and you realize there's a missing lemma, and you go, oh, yeah, that's an assumption, which I need to write down and possibly go and validate with my customer. There was a famous case, there's a tool called Astray that was used to do verification of the Airbus flight control software, where they discovered a potential integer overflow in the, air, you know, the flight control software if, you know, and it would happen if the aircraft had been in the air for 84 hours or something. And you go, uh, oh, okay, yeah, that's not going to happen because you've run out of fuel at that point. It's not going to be, you know, an, an A380 can't be in the air for 84 hours. But at least you find that and you can document it as an assumption. And then outside of proof world, you go and test or validate those assumptions by some other method. But at least you've got a definitive list of them. Um, and once you're happy with them, you can plug them back into the theorem prover and say, take this for granted. You know, time of flight is less than 84 hours. Plug it in and bang, it takes advantage of it. Um, but it's nice to have this documented list of assumptions that you can you can kind of say, yeah, this is a proof. It's all there are always assumptions. I mean, we always have assumptions. We assume the compiler is not doing stupid things. We assume the hardware is executing the instructions correctly. People always somebody will always say, oh, what about a single event upset? What about a cosmic radiation slams the RAM chip? Um, well, if you want to deal with them, you just speak to the space people. They know how to deal with that. They they build red hard kit and redundant kit. And they know how to do it. So fine, there are ways of dealing with it. But there are always assumptions underpinning this formal stuff. You just need to be aware of them and write them down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Someone from Arm. A small response to our friend's criticism of the ISA. Um, right. We do we do have good reasons for stuff being um, uh, undefined or unpredictable. Um, and if you read the Arm Arm carefully, it will it does say unpredictable in the ISIS space represents programmer error. So you are just not supposed to output those instructions. So one way to formally verify uh, your compiler or whatever is just to say, do not do those instructions. Yeah. There are good reasons for them existing. Um, well, I do have a question though, which is, um, you say that, uh, I think you said that grads come out of university not having a clue how to do formal. We talked a bit about it at lunch um, or uh, not even a mindset to even consider it. 
how do you go about changing that mindset? Like, what's, um, the, what's the solution? We, we, in, in recruiting grads, we look for you know, the ones that are really good at maths, the ones that are curious about the formal stuff, and not, not rejecting it. Um, we look for the ones that want to learn. I mean, in re even recruiting contractors, we say to people, look, we're going to, we know you don't know this funny niche programming language that you've never heard of, but we're going to train you. Um, if they want to be trained and they're curious, great. If they say, oh, I don't, you know, that's not a cool, funky language, um, and, you know, it's not going to look good on my CV, they fail the interview. Bye. They shut them the door. Um, we, we, I mean, the IFAX project, the air traffic control thing, that peaked at 120 engineers with a development team of about 60. So that was quite a lot of recruitment and training. And yes, we run training courses in-house, even graduates. We have a series of training things that we have to do with graduates to teach them about, not just formal, we have to teach them how to review their own stuff. I mean, universities, would you believe, don't teach grads how to review their own work, let alone review anyone else's work. And that's really important. And yeah, we teach them about programming, we teach them about formal stuff or whatever. We have to do this training. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a, with a big project like IFAX, it's a tiny amount of budget to do that in comparison to the, the whole cost of the project. Training is a microscopic amount of money. It's not big at all. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. I'm going to all right. end your questions there, but stay on the stage because we're going to invite up our other panelists. Oh, I'll get a report. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>